My dearly beloved in Christ, last Sunday's gospel was on the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And as I mentioned, it was the first of a short series that I would like to give on the true Mass in comparison to the Novus Ordo Mise. And you will recall that last Sunday I quoted from the prophet Malachi, who said, From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, my name is great among the Gentiles, for in every nation there is offered to me a sacrifice, a clean oblation for sin. And all of the fathers are in agreement that the prophet Malachi, who wrote this four or five hundred years before Christ, was referring to the institution of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And it is wonderful to think that with the various time zones of the world, that throughout the day, Mass is going on somewhere in the world, the continual sacrifice. And it has been said that the world could more easily exist without the sun than without the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Why? Because the Mass, once again, is Jesus himself offering his life to his Father to atone for sin, to draw down God's mercy and blessings upon the world. And so how much we need the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But this also would help us understand why the devil hates the Mass. And the devil has always sought to destroy the Mass using various human beings, heretics and so forth, to seek to destroy the Mass, which is his goal. Our Lord, as recorded in the 24th chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, when he was talking about the end of times and the coming of Antichrist, etc., he said, when you see the abomination of desolation in the holy place, then you know the time is at hand. Well, St. Alphonsus Liguori, a doctor of the church, says that our Lord was referring to a time when the true Mass would be taken away and would be replaced by a false Mass, a, a ceremony that would be an imitation of the true Mass, but not the true thing. And of course, we believe that is the time in which we live. But this has happened before. In the Reformation the so-called Reformation, Martin Luther, who had been a Catholic priest, left the church, and he had some very severe words about the Mass. He said, call it the Lord's Supper, the commemoration of the Last Supper, a meal. Don't call it the sacrifice of the Mass. He particularly did not want that term used, sacrifice. And he took the Mass as it was, and he changed it around and brought in another ceremony for the people. Much the same as has been done over the last 50 years. Also in England, the same thing was done under King Henry VIII and Archbishop Cranmer. Again, bringing in a different ceremony. Calling it the Lord's Supper, having the priests face the people, having it in the vernacular, all the things that happened since Vatican II. So the devil has always sought to destroy the Mass, and again, he has used human instruments to try and bring this about. But in our times, those who have brought about the Novus Ordo Mise are the modernists. Now, Pope St. Pius X in 1907 condemned the heresy of modernism. And he said that modernism is a synthesis of all the heresies that is, have existed down through the centuries. To put it in a very simple way, modernists are those who believe in relativism. In other words, what was wrong 200 years ago to a modernist maybe isn't wrong today because they believe that changing times necessitate changing morality and changing doctrine. So modernists believe in relativism, but they also are fanatics when it comes to change. They like to change. They want everything to change. And even before the 1960s, going back to the 30s and the 40s, there were a few priests here and there infected with modernist ideas who began to experiment. 
turned the altar around, had the priest face the people, put certain things in the vernacular, and so forth. And Pope Pius XII found out about this, and he wrote an encyclical, a masterpiece, on the liturgy called Mediator Dei. I believe it was published in 1947. And in that encyclical, interestingly, he says that there are certain individuals who would like to change the Mass and change it into the language of the people, the vernacular, who would like to turn the altar around. And he went on to list different things that people wanted, that modernists wanted. And he showed how wrong all of these ideas were and condemned them. And what's interesting is you might think this encyclical was written after the Novus Ordo came in because everything he condemns and forbids was eventually done. The modernists used what I would refer to as the liturgical movement. The liturgical movement is a term we use for the greater emphasis on the liturgy over the past couple hundred years. The modern liturgical movement began around the year 1850, 1840s, 1850s, with a monk, an abbot in France, named Abbot Geringer. <clears throat> and Dom Prosper Geringer studied the liturgy, promoted an increase of scholarship on the liturgy. He published a 15-volume work called The Liturgical Year, which is an absolute treasure. And, promote, and wrote a number of other books. So this inaugurated, again, a movement to learn more about the liturgy, to appreciate it more. So the liturgical movement was good, but it was eventually hijacked by the modernists. Also, other good changes were Pope St. Pius X promoted frequent Holy Communion, any early Holy Communion for children. He promoted... Um, the use of Gregorian chant, wrote his fam famous motu proprio on uh, music in the sacred liturgy. He also promoted the use of the Missal, where you have Latin on one side and then English or whatever the language of the different countries so you could understand the prayers the priest was saying. And so there were these various efforts made to understand and appreciate and value, as we should, the sacred liturgy. But again, the modernists used this movement to bring all these changes into the liturgy. But these changes didn't come overnight. They weren't all at once, they were gradual. And this is why people back in the 1960s continued to go to church and one Sunday this would be changed and another Sunday that would be changed. And over time, they accepted this Novus Ordo Mise because they were prepared for it. And I will go into, especially next Sunday, some specific changes made in the Novus Ordo Mise. But I would like to talk today more about some general observations. And first of all, the change of language. Why is the Mass said in Latin? Because the modernists said, we need to have the Mass in the language of the people because the people don't understand Latin. How many people know Latin? And so we need to make sure they understand it. Well, there are several fallacies in that argument. Number one, the people were not completely ignorant because, as I said, they had missiles with Latin and English and they could follow the English. They knew the prayers the priest was saying. But another point is, do they even need to know what the priest is saying? The priest is taking the place of Christ and offering the Mass to God. You could have an illiterate person, as you did in the Middle Ages, not that many people could read or write, who wouldn't know the prayers, but that person is there in the church devoutly praying, mentally joining his or her will to that of the priest offering the Mass and obtaining many graces. Think back to the Old Testament, back before you had microphones to amplify sound. You had this huge temple, and there was the priest way up there offering the sacrifice. And those who were there in the temple couldn't hear the ritual prayers the priest was saying as he made the sacrifice. They were too far away. 
But that didn't mean that somehow the sacrifice was less important to God or to those in attendance. And also, after the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity, hardly anyone spoke Hebrew anymore. And yet the liturgy in the Old Testament was still in Hebrew. And so the people now spoke Aramaic due to the long captivity, 70 years in another country. And so Hebrew was now only known by the rabbis, the scholars. It wasn't spoken by the people. And that didn't mean, again, that the sacrifices were any less important. So that is, uh, again, a, uh, an argument that is made that doesn't hold water. In fact, I would say, well, if the people can understand it so much better, how come so many Catholics have left the church? How come so many people stopped going to Mass and went into other religions or just did nothing? So you can see the fallacy of that argument. But why do we have the Mass in Latin? Because for several reasons. First of all, Latin is a dead language, by which we mean it is not spoken in any country in the world as the common language of the people. And consequently, the meaning of the words does not undergo a change. We speak English, really, I should say American, because some of the words we use have a different meaning for someone in England or Australia or some other country where English is spoken because it's a living language and undergoes a change over time. Even the way we speak English today is different from the style or the way people spoke it in this country 200 years ago. So it's a living language, whereas Latin is the ideal language for the liturgy where the meaning of the words will not change and therefore it preserves doctrinal integrity. Also, Latin serves as a wonderful mark of the unity of the church. You could go, before Vatican II, you could go to any country, go into a Roman Catholic church, and the Mass would be the same as it was in your parish church. And you could attend and understand. The priest gets up and gives a sermon. You have no idea what he's saying, but you would feel at home because the Mass was the same. Also, the fact that not everybody knows Latin. In fact, in fact, most of the people don't know other than some words. That lends itself to convey the mystery, the, the sacredness of the rite of Holy Mass. So it adds to the dignity and the beauty and the solemnity of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is worship being given to Almighty God. So that is why the Mass is in Latin. Early on, the Mass was offered in Greek. And scholars believe that it began to universally throughout Europe being offered in Latin beginning around the middle of the 3rd century, maybe a little more, in the 200s. And ever since then, Mass has been offered in, in Latin. And also, this is an interesting point, that um, the Mass, as we say it, what we refer to as the Tridentine Mass, because of the count, Tridentine comes from the word Trent, the Council of Trent, which uh, made it known or, or decreed that uh, a new Missal was to come out. And the purpose of the Missal was to make sure that there was unity, because there were some minor changes from one country to another, one city to another, one diocese to another, and in order to have uniformity. But when Pope St. Pius V promulgated the Roman Missal in 1570, he didn't come up with a new Missal. I believe the only thing he added was the last Gospel of St. John which was said in some places and not others. And he said the Mass is to be the same, it's never to be changed again until the end of time. And he said if anyone will dare to tamper with or change even one word of the Mass, he will incur the wrath of God and of the holy apostles Peter and Paul. And I believe those words of St. Pius V were prophetic because he knew a time would come when efforts would be made to change the Mass as has happened, sadly, over the last 50 years. Also, the Mass, even, even before Pius V, 
was virtually the same as it was at the time of St. Gregory the Great and even before. We believe that the prayers of the canon were written by St. Ambrose, who lived in the 4th century. So the Mass has existed almost entirely unchanged for at least 1,500 years or longer, until again the modernists change it. So we mentioned Latin, why we have the Mass in Latin. Another general observation about the change of the Novus Ordo Mise was the complete elimination or loss of reverence. If the Mass is the worship of God, then we must be reverent, attentive. We must realize we're in the presence of God. But look at what happened when the Novus Ordo came in. People were told when they came up for communion to stand instead of to kneel. They now receive communion on the hand. And lay people get up and become Eucharistic ministers. And there was always an excuse for every change. So the excuse was, oh, the priests, we don't have that many priests and they're busy and they have a lot to do. So what happens now in a typical Novus Ordo church? The lay Eucharistic ministers give up to give out communion and the priest goes and sits down in a chair. So you can see the, the fallacy of that argument just like all of their arguments for a a means of trying to change and get people to accept the changes. But the loss of reverence. I remember reading a bulletin that someone gave me like 20 years ago from a church that has the Novus Ordo. And in this bulletin it had an article on what it called the gathering right. And it said, you might be annoyed when people come into church and they're talking in the church before Mass, because you might want to pray, but that's being selfish. You should join in because God is love and God wants us to be joyful. And so there should be this conversation and greeting your neighbor before Mass and so forth. A complete loss of the sense that the church is the house of God and that the Mass is offered to God. Everything now has been focused on the people and the social aspect, the communal aspect, and again, the loss of reverence. So the lack of kneeling. Some churches even eliminated kneelers altogether. The priest, when he is ordained, his hands are anointed with the sacred oil. His hands are consecrated so that he can handle worthily the Holy Eucharist. And now anyone and everyone goes up, receives it in the hand. Hosts are fall on the floor. They're found left in the pews. All kinds of sacrileges. And so we see this loss of reverence. When you look at the Novus Ordo Mise, what really strikes one especially is the loss of reverence. During the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, the canon and the offertory, the priest prays the prayers in a silent voice. Why? Because of the mystery and the Mass is offered to God. And now it's out loud. Again, there's, there's a loss of all of the sense of mystery. So next Sunday, I will go into the new Mass, the Novus Ordo Mise, in greater detail, the different parts of the new Mass. But let us especially appreciate the holy sacrifice of the Mass, that we have the grace to understand, to reject the Novus Ordo Mise, and to realize that this Mass, The Tridentin Mass is the true Mass pleasing to Almighty God. May we never take it for granted, and may we always be attentive and reverent at every Mass that we are privileged to attend. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.